Hello, my name is Pat Welter with TVO.com. Sitting here at the Hyde Park Cine Bistro with Joe Belcastro. Hey. Joe, I know you write for, I don't know, like 50 publications, modern journalism. Well, you have, world. yeah, you have seen my signature line, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot. I'm the modern day journalist. Uh, sometimes I use the word I'm like a, a writing whore, so to speak, these days. There we go. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think it's, you know, it's a blessing and a curse. Yeah, I'm, I have a huge reach, but, uh, you know, you do kind of want to funnel it all in the one spot. But, you know, down the road, I'm, I'm sure that will happen. So who are you writing for specifically for our audience so they know where to find you? Find me? Let's see. How about we'll promote uh, CraveOnline.com. I'm doing a lot with them, and I'm a big supporter of that site. I write for the Tampa Tribune, contribute to them. And uh, I've written for CBS Tampa, Examiner.com, still run some of my movies. We're stopping right there, Tampa Tribune. We are company. <laughs> yes. All right, so we're going to get to your review of Star Trek. That's the movie of the week. And we're also mm -hmm. drinking some beer here, because you can at this movie theater. Um, That's how I roll. <laughs> so we're going to get to your, your review of Star Trek. Uh, Enter Darkness. Okay. Um, but first, I want to start with Iron Man. It's the number one movie out there. Mm -hmm. it's your first big blockbuster of the summer. Um, most critics are just kind of giving it a pass. It's an entertaining uh, popcorn film. I thought I thought it was good. I enjoyed it. But you're kind of holding it to a little bit of a higher standard. You know what? I, I am. You're right. Iron Man. I love the first Iron Man. I know everyone says all oh, the first ones always the best. But look, that comic book movie was one of the top two or three I've ever seen. And so I was really into Iron Man. And then the sequel came out a couple years back. And I was like, OK, you know, it's, it's obviously a step down from the original, but still good. And then this one came out, and they made some changes in terms of who's directing it. And I think that's where it didn't really jive with me. And I thought I was just watching an action flick with no flow. It didn't feel like a comic book movie anymore until you know a few scenes with action, which was mind blowing. The visuals are great. But I don't know, I mean, I, I felt it's definitely uh, regressing as they make more. Well, I think you look at um, Christopher Nolan's Batman trilogy, trilogy yeah. thing, right? So like, they're trying to make a trilogy, but if it's a different guy's vision, like you said, the first two were directed by uh, John Favreau, and then this time we go Shane to Black is the guy who took it this time. Now, this is only the second movie he's ever directed. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that you, know, you should judge somebody about how many movies they direct, but I'm like, OK. He did Kiss Kiss Bang Bang in 2005, I believe. And that did star Robert Downey Jr. And what he's known for, Shane Black, that is, is writing. He's an amazing screenwriter. And he, he specialized in action comedies early on. He did all the Lethal <laughs> Weapon movies. And he, uh, I don't know, he, he went at this. He probably wrote a great script again. But when he tried to take his own vision, and I think this is always a little tricky when you're the writer and the director, he took his own vision. And it, I think it was just too much for him. I didn't think he knew what he was biting off. You know, mm -hmm. and so he was good in certain scenes and not so good, and then he just couldn't really piece it together. I thought, and so I wasn't engaged in the story. I, I love the visuals. Again, I'll, I'll say that all day. Those are great. Right. But uh, you didn't kind of. You didn't. My my brain wasn't really working this time. It was just like, oh, it's just another summer popcorn flick, as they say. It's still a good movie. I think we both yeah. agree that it's worth Look, seeing. I know. The thing is, I gave it on this at site I reviewed it for it was six out of ten. Which isn't mean. I'm not saying don't see it. I'm not saying it sucks. But you know, the, the where where the Iron Man franchise is, every fanboy thinks like I totally slammed it. It's like I didn't. I mean, it's still a decent movie. It's just not as good as the other ones. You know. Oh, I don't think it's going anywhere because it's making a ton of money. And right behind it at the box office is The Great Gatsby. And yeah. This is kind of an unorthodox blockbuster. Not a lot of violence. Not a lot of explosions. But a lot of music and dancing, and it's kind of splitting critics critics right down the middle, and I, you're right there with them too, aren't you? I, I'm in the middle, literally, because I was, I liked, there's parts I loved about it, and then parts I just didn't like about it. And it, you're right, it, it is loud. It's, I think I wrote something along the lines of, it's a, it's a rap video with well-groomed white people, yeah. you know, just dancing to Jay-Z and crap like that. And literally dancing to Jay-Z, because that's a soundtrack. For a movie that's set in 1920s, the soundtrack is Jay-Z, uh, Beyonce and all well, What other options did they have? I'm not going to pretend like I know 1920s music. I'm sure I good I mean, jazz do you remember uh, reading Great Gatsby? Because I don't think I, I think I skimmed it at best right. in high school. I did reread it again before yeah. this movie, and I'm, I'm going to tell you uh, a confession here. I went to, to Barnes and Noble free at the Barnes and Noble. Right. Go to buy the book. 
and I didn't want to be seen on the beach with the movie cover version, <laughs> so I spent the extra 25 for the hardcover with the original. <laughs> Uh, I like that. Yeah, that's that's me. I try not to be super. I can but, actually see you yeah. sitting there, like looking at the, in the bookstore, looking at both covers. Like, yeah. you know what? Yeah, I didn't want to be that guy, but I'm that guy. Hey, I watch don't. movies. I don't read. But, oh, well, that sounds bad. But all right, we're no. gonna we're gonna <laughs> move back to the movie yeah, itself. Yeah. Um, the book is so reserved and kind of subtle, whereas mm -hmm. the movie was so loud, and that's kind of Baz Luhrmann style. I guess if, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but I feel like we. He's a little, kind of a loud, boisterous, flamboyant director. He's over the top yeah. in certain turns, uh, for sure. And that's what the whole first 45 minutes is of this movie. It's just, it hits you. And it's just, you know, a big spectacle. Right. But there's nothing to really grasp onto, you know. And I'm not saying every movie has to be like that, but, you know, it's a great Gatsby. It's a great American novel. Right. I was expecting, you know, to get a little bit of deep development early on. But no, it's just pretty much a loud, noisy uh, production. And then when it slows down, that's when things start to come up together, and the three act, three leads, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio, Tobey Maguire, and I'm forgetting the chick all of a sudden. Well, I thought she was... Who is the chick? She's from Drive. Uh, Michelle, Wh Michelle Williams. Different one. No? She looks like Michelle yeah, Williams. Yeah, crap. This is that. It's okay. All right. We'll put it in, in, in post-production. <laughs> no, no, uh, no. You leave that. And then the other girl I thought would look like Rooney Mara, but it, it's... Oh, no, it's not, her. it's not either. But uh, on the subject of the actors, I found myself most captivated by uh, by uh, Joel Edgerton and the Rooney Mara lookalike. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to DiCaprio and Tobey Maguire. So, Pearson, your thoughts? Because those guys put a lot out there. It's a big challenge for actors in that role. Yeah, because you know what? It's a heavyweight going against a heavyweight. And not that they're against each other, they're trying to work together. But, you know, seeing one larger than life performance next to another larger than life performance, if you want to call it that. It's tough sometimes for, for that to come out across to the audience, you know? I see the chemistry, but then again, I watch a movie every day. So right. I'm kind of used to seeing things now and I understand how it works. But for some people, it could be overwhelming. And then they might not care because it's too hard and you don't want to think. Right. You know, believe it or not, there's people that hate Inception because they're like, why am I thinking so hard in a movie? Well, you know, they have a legitimate gripe because sometimes you shouldn't be. If you don't get it, you know, you can't judge anybody's intelligence, but you know, you might not just get it. Yeah. Gatsby was the exact opposite. There's just so much, uh, there's so much going on without a lot of explanation until later on, and then it's just a simple love triangle, and you, you kind of want to know more about the, the atmosphere of the 1920s, because I think that's what the book was like, right? You right. I did. Yeah. It's see that they, the movie focused on the romance, the Caprio, when it's really supposed to be kind of just this like critique of the American dream, right? Not to get all heavy on the audience, but like, I mean, people have to understand that there's like reasons for it is that it has to make money, right? This movie has a hundred million dollar budget, so you have to get yeah. DiCaprio in there. Mm -hmm. That's how Nolan got his skyrocket budget for Inception, you cast that kind of a star. Yeah. But I wonder if maybe if they would have gone with somebody maybe less unknown, less known as an actor, maybe it would have come off better. Do you, do you agree with that? It, it, it always can, and sometimes that is the best approach to take. I don't think it's so much of the acting, though, that's really bugging people. I think people hate on Tobey Maguire because it's cool to hate on Tobey Maguire. Yeah, he's I think, kind of quirky. And... Yeah, I like the dude. I thought he was great in that. I actually don't mind him as Spider-Man, too. And that always gets me in trouble when I say that. But uh, I guess here's the question that I think people want to, should be asking. Yeah. Who should have directed it? Right. Do you have anybody in mind? Well, I like to play this game a lot. Cause okay. For me, let's, I'm kind of... Let's play your game. I, I like to play because then I feel like, all right, well, what would it have looked like if he did it? Mm -hmm. So for me... I loved uh, the place Beyond the Pines a lot. Okay. And Derek, uh, C in France. Sure. We're gonna. His, <laughs> I feel like his name's gonna be a household name soon. And like, but it, just the way he hit into that in Blue Valentine, the way he kind of deals with the romance in that, and mm -hmm. then was also able to handle handle like the epicness of Place Beyond the Pines. Okay. I don't know. I kind of feel like that maybe more that more intimate approach and more gritty approach would have been better than like the glossy approach. The place beyond the pines. I like what you said about that. How there's an epic epicness to it. Yeah. Right. That's that's good because it's such a subtle movie, really. Right. When it boils down to it. it's not flashy, it's gritty, it's straightforward, but uh, it is basically an epic. It's also two and a half hours long, so maybe that has something but to do with it. But you feel like that, and I think like the Gatsby is like subtly epic because it's like the American dream, whereas. Instead of hitting you in the face, that's slow. Burn. Yeah. Yeah. Look, the Gatsby is <laughs> the Gatsby. I just I just renamed the movie. Yeah. I like it better actually. The Gatsby. Yeah. It's like The Rock. Yeah. Um, I would say that's a movie everyone can see, and I don't think anyone's going to be angry at it unless you're you know unless you're holding yeah. it to the letter of the book. Mm -hmm. 
you can't be mad at this movie. It's not, I don't, I mean, sure, people slam it, but, you know, there's critics out there that just slam things and slam things, especially during the summer movie season. Well, let's get into your philosophy as a film critic, because nowadays, social media, Twitter, yeah. everybody thinks they're a critic, but there's, there's, certain, there's a method to it. Everyone has their own method. What's your method? What's your criteria for how you judge movies? Going cold. I, I made this decision a few years back. No, I don't watch trailers at all. And fortunately, when we go to a press screening, we don't have trailers. It's just all, you know, movie starts, it's five of us in the theater usually, like the other press people around here. And then it just uh, kind of just goes. We watch the movie. I don't go on IMDb, which is a you know, movie database where it says everyone who's in it, uh, what's it about, you know. Details, I don't want to know. I just think you got to go in cold and just accept what it is on screen. And then you get a more natural reaction to it. And that, and I just want to do that you know, for people, because you know, if, if I start knowing every little thing that goes on, and trust me, I can watch a trailer, I can probably tell you what's going to happen in the movie, and then if there's a scene that sticks out in my head, and I don't see it you know, in the first hour and a half in the movie, I'm like, oh crap, I know what the ending's going to be. I think it's funny, because sometimes you, when you go to the theater, I try to show up as late as possible to miss the trailers, because I watch them and I'm so exhausted. By yeah. the end of it, I feel like I've watched three movies, because for like a bad movie, yeah. You watch the, watch the trailer, that's the whole movie. Like mm -hmm. uh, even like something like a, a heart warmer, right? Like Blindside, you yeah. watch that trailer, you feel like you know the whole movie. I mean, I saw the movie, I actually liked it more than I thought I would. Right. But I, 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 just, I feel like it's hard for people not to watch the trailer. Like Batman, if they make another one, how are we not gonna watch the trailer? I found a way, man. I mean, I spent more time, even when I have been in a, a theater with trailers, I mean, <laughs> this is bad to say, but I've stared more at my crotch than any man <laughs> ever should, because <laughs> I'm looking down the whole time. While these things are going on, I have yeah. people, you know, my fellow critics who are like friends of mine, they're all ripping on me constantly. And you know, some people try to bait me into watching trailers. They'll post it on my Facebook wall, and I'll just delete it right away. Moving <laughs> on to the one we've all been waiting for, big movie of the weekend, Star Trek. Mm -hmm. And this is one where I read your review, and you wrote a rare eye review for this one, where you just kind of lost yourself in the movie, is that right? Yeah, I never have referred to myself in the first person or anything like that, and I never did an eye review. It's like, I like this, I like that. That's kind of tacky in our industry. But I did it for this, because that's all I was thinking during the movie, because I love the first one a lot. And I'm not a Trekkie by any means. I don't, I'm not married to Star Trek. I don't care about it, really. But I saw that, how he rebooted 2009, I thought it was genius. Mm. I was like, wow. I couldn't believe they, they did time travel. You do time travel in the movie, you're gonna you're setting yourself up for failure. Hello, Terminator Four, if right. you remember that one. Any time the movie does time travel, except for Back to the Future and maybe Looper. Looper was pretty good. That came out last. Well, even year. Looper, they acknowledge the fact that hey, it was almost like the screenwriter breaking the the wall, telling the audience, hey, we're gonna kind of just gloss over some. Yeah, he's stuff. winking at you. He's yeah. like, you know what? It's a time travel movie. It's give fun. me give me a freaking break, you yeah. know. So that's cool. But uh, you know, uh, where was I talking here? J.J. Abrams took it and he just, he made it the film's biggest asset. Right. Okay, that was amazing. So then, here we go, the sequel. Were my expectations up? Yes. Two movies this year I'm looking forward to see. It was that one, and I really want to see what the Nolan does with Man of Steel. Can anybody tell I'm a Nolan? I got a semi for Nolan here. We kind of, <laughs> we kind of play a game where we're like, well, I wish Christopher Nolan directed that. Everything. That's he the should, answer to every Look, movie. he should do everything, as long as he can, and if he doesn't get tired out. But anyway. Into Darkness is just as good as the first one. There's some people that think, the only people I have, I've seen uh, slam it, or not slam it, but just not be totally into it, were people that admittedly say we are big Star Trek fans. And that goes for both critics and uh, just you know audience members. They say we are loyal Star Trek people, Trekkies, whatever you want to call them. And they're like, okay, it's okay, but it's not as good as everyone thinks it is. I think it's mind blowing. I mean, I saw it twice. I did the original screening, the press screening, weeks in advance, and then I just went to another one uh, that was for like promo or something like that on the day of opening. And I, I think it's great, man. I mean, he, first of all, he's a perfect guy for Star Wars. Let me tell you that. I mean, he almost right. like made this like, look what I will do for Star Wars, because this will probably be the last Star Trek he directs. I almost wonder if nerds can even process that in their minds that this guy is so lucky to direct Star Trek and Star Wars. I mean, how many people? Boys' dreams from the seventies. You, that. Uh, we were talking earlier, full disclosure, and you you think it's kind of unfair in a way, don't you? Well, I just like it. Just seems too much. It's like I'm just gonna put it out there that I love Spielberg. Yeah. And I want to be Spielberg, and then it's like the intern that gets his dream come true. You want to be Spielberg? I'm gonna take you by your hand. Obviously, he's really talented, but it's like he 
pictured this life for himself and he made it happen. Down to just how he looks. If anyone's do this with people, Google J.J. Abrams and Steven Spielberg, and they, they're clones. I mean, one's the younger version, one's the older version, obviously. But I mean, how eerie do they look together? Same glasses, same almost facial features. They're making the same movies. Right. And it's just like uncanny. I mean, I don't know how Abrams did that. I don't know if George Spielberg did something. But anyway, the point is, <laughs> he's just as good as Spielberg, or he's going to be just as good Whoa, as Spielberg, that's, I think. Now, that's something right there. I think he's going to be just as good. I didn't, the only movie I didn't like he, that he did was Super, Super, was 8. Super 8, yeah. That was like I was like a little too cliche, a little too you know. He was I, trying too hard to please. He, he's like, I want to just make a Spielberg movie. I want to show you I can do it. And great, technically you did it. Um, it was something we've all seen before. But okay, you did it. Get it out of your system. But now he's putting his own little stamp on things. And when he sh- he shows off in this Into Darkness movie, he does things that he's like top this. Go ahead. Well, that's interesting because you, you we're going to compare it to Spielberg. We have to compare. The whole body of work is Spielberg, right? I mean, obviously, he's got a lot more years yeah. on Abrams, but he has those movies. He's got the Jurassic Park, which is the perfect blockbuster. Then he's got the Munich and the Schindler's List. Well, he did the first ever summer blockbuster, which no one really uh, ever thinks about. Jaws was technically the first ever summer blockbuster, you know, and that made two hundred and something million at that time, mm-hmm. way back then, which would blow everything out of the water now with inflation. But he created the first summer blockbuster, and he actually did it with both what we were talking about earlier, like the substantial parts and then the action with the shark, you know? So yeah, I mean, and then he also made War Horse, which I think sucks, <laughs> but you know, whatever. Thing Makes is, a lot of money as a play, satisfying the, the play crowd. Well, let's talk about what he does then. You're talking about creating those characters as well as the action. So well, that the biggest the payoff, how does J.J. Abrams do that in this movie? He just, he struck gold with the cast. He found a cast that is just pitch perfect in terms of not only uh, being loyal to what you know, William Shatner, Leonard Nimoy, and all those old Trekkie guys created. They are doing that perfectly, but they're also giving their own little nuances to it. And it's funny, but it's also like emotionally gratifying because you actually care about every single one of those characters. Even though a lot of the focus is on uh, Chris Pine, who plays uh, Captain Kirk. Every character is awesome, and you, you don't get to say that too often. But back, you know, 15 years ago, every guy they had that was filling up a show was interesting. Their storyline was interesting. This is what Star Trek is. Everything is interesting. Simon Pegg is interesting. Um, somebody that has maybe three scenes in the m- entire movie Zoe is... Zoe Zaldana. Oh, look at you. You want to go right to her? <laughs> yeah. I couldn't help myself. I'm, She's I'm interesting, too. She's interesting <laughs> in a lot of ways. But they're all just... They're all just so amazingly talented and working together, and they only work together, you know, twice now. None of them have ever really worked together before. Mm-hmm. You know, Zachary Quinto is playing Spock almost better than Spock. And it's like, how the hell did he do that, you know? Let's touch on Chris Pine. I want to go back to that for a second. Okay. In my, my personal opinion, I look at guys like Ryan Gosling, Bradley Cooper as the next uh, kind of Brad Pitt, George Clooney heir to that throne, if you will. Okay. And then I look at Chris Pine as a guy that is trying to maybe step up. So do you think he can get to that level? Can he be a superstar? He can, and I'm going. I'm going through the movies that you know, not many people may have seen him in. Like this is War, it was pretty cool. It was a fun comedy, little romantic comedy thing. So he can do a wide range of things. So yeah, your uh, your instincts about him, you know, hanging around, maybe getting there and be able to carry a movie on his own. I think he can do it, definitely. Well, we still got plenty of time, and uh, yeah. judging by the way it's Star Trek's doing so far, I think he's gonna have more movies to come. Well, yeah, it's going to definitely knock off Iron Man this weekend, for sure. Well, we will leave the villain discussion for another time, because we don't want to give away the whole movie. Well, so we, we can't say his last it. name, either. Let me have it written down. Benedict Cumberbatch. Yeah. He's good. Let's just he's say a, that. He's an excellent, excellent villain. It's probably not a secret right now, you know, by the time this airs, that, you know, what who he is, if you really know Star Trek, but uh, he's awesome. And... Uh, He'll, he'll hang around to the point where we'll be able to say his name fluently because we're going to get to hear a lot about him. Exactly. Yeah. And we look forward to doing some more of these again. Yeah. And check out your Hangover 3 review coming up. When are we going to be able to see that? Hangover 3, I'll be seeing uh, actually a few hours from now. And let's just hope it's better than the second one because that first one was gold, but that second one really, really tarnished it, I think. So they, got, they had some making up to do, but they have the talent to do it. All right, well, that's going to do it for us. Uh, We could talk for hours, but we're going to let you guys get back to life outside of movies, if that exists. 
doesn't really for me. For Joe, Pas Joe Belcastro, I'm Pat Walter from the Hyde Park Cine Bistro. Thanks, guys. Bye.